Okay, uh, we have a young lady over here with the microphone, and is there another one? Uh, how about this fellow over here in the center aisle? Ra raise your hand so, so, that, uh, the, so that we can find you. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. It's just a small point, but I think an important one. Um, I thought I heard Daniel Huff say that Mohammed al Jura was killed. Um, how, how then do you explain the fact that uh, there were no wounds on his body and uh, we see him peering through his uh, fingers once he thinks the cameraman has finished filming? Okay, the fellow with the beard behind you. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, could, why, could you come up here and repeat that? I, I'm sorry, the mics on the tables aren't working. I'm, I'm glad he pointed that out. I, I don't know the details of it. I was relying on the statement in the Atlantic Monthly article to the effect that the boy had been killed. If he hadn't, all the better. The point is that you have an independent researcher and author who's working on these issues to try to defeat the claim that has been very detrimental to the Israeli government, and the government was not responding. They relied on this third party, and that's why we need to protect them from these types of predatory lawsuits. Okay. And by the way, I just want to remind all the questioners to make it a question, not a speech. Uh, uh, okay, you'll be next. Uh, the fellow here is the next questioner. Uh, Iran is absolutely the most problematic country in the world, so Mr. Kotler, why is no country in the world doing anything? Why are we all sitting on our hands? Uh, does anyone want to say something quickly about that? I think it's, well, I guess that uh, directly goes to what you said, so Erwin, why don't you, uh, why, don't you have, why don't you take that? I, I think basically it comes down to an absence of uh, political will and an absence of, of any commitment to do that, really what, what is uh, legally uh, obligatory. I, I'll just share with you one astonishing thing that makes me feel that politicians live in a legal bubble and get disconnected. In August, and sorry, in April 2004, I attended a meeting of G8 ministers of justice hosted here uh, in, in Washington. The issue of Darfur was not on the agenda. I asked uh, our host, James Ashcroft, if it uh, would be put on the agenda, if, should it not be on the agenda? And he said, well, you know, civil servants put it together, but you know what, I'll give you 10 minutes of dinner to speak about it. I spoke about it at dinner, and I can tell you that afterwards, four out of the eight G8 ministers of justice told me that was the first they ever heard about Darfur. And that is a shocking acknowledgement on their part. And I'm saying that I believe, and I've gone around to different countries, that I don't think that there is a sufficient yet understanding of the danger of state-sanctioned incitement to genocide, or even, even a knowledge of the precursors to genocide that do exist in Ahmadinejad's Jazzy Rats. This conference here can sound the alarm, can serve as a wake-up call to bring Ahmadinejad's Jazzy Rats to justice. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the gentleman, I, uh, uh, the, the gentleman standing in the front row here. Uh, I've studied uh, the Quran about, I've read about 19, 20 times. I've also read Mein Kampf. And uh, the Quran speaks about genocide, whereas Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf never discusses the final solution. So my question is, why don't we take hate speech laws, turn them back on them, and cite quotes from the Quran that says, kill and destroy Judeo Christianity, and make it hate speech and make it banned? Sounds like that's a question for Marvin. Yeah, use their stuff against them. I mean, the Quran preaches preach genocide. I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the best ways I've repeatedly pointed this out with anyone who uh, believes in introducing further hate speech laws or blasphemy laws and so on, but um, I very much hope that, uh, and indeed uh, the uh, OIC's plans at the UN, I've repeatedly said the best thing that can be said to them to put them off their plan is to say that if you uh, really are going to push uh, such a law through the UN, the first thing we'll get banned is the Quran uh, because of its call for violence against, against, among other things, Hindus and our friends who are polytheists, as the Quran describes them. That's not a bad way to put the OIC off of being quite so keen on that. If I can just quickly, uh, the, the gentleman who asked why people aren't doing anything about Iran, this sort of neatly ties this in. One of the problems is 
that everyone is still fighting, uh, what, uh, in my opinion, everyone is still fighting a previous conflict. People in Europe and America, and this great example we just had for Canada, seriously seem to believe that the biggest threat, a lot of people think this, the biggest threat is far-right, white, white supremacist, uh, uh, you know, jack-booted Nazis marching through the streets of Europe. That isn't going to happen. Everyone's pretty much wise up to that. Uh, but when, uh, when you have uh, your, your instruments of state and your courts being tied up in pursuing uh, a, a menace that was there before but has changed and is in a different situation this time, it means you don't deal with the problem now because you're too busy trying to imagine that you're going to deal with the same problem as last time. And this is exactly what happened uh, in Weimar, Germany. There were, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, my colleague referred earlier to uh, to a striker and his sperma. Well, striker went to prison. It is, didn't do any good at all in stopping Adolf Hitler's rise. In fact, if the only way that you can expose hatred is by allowing people to say it and by knowing where you stand. At the moment, we're fighting last century's enemy, and we're not dealing with this century's one. The, uh, the, the argument about the Quran and hate speech is one that Gerd Wilders has also made, and has been accused, I don't know if formally or only informally, uh, of hate speech for that statement. I'm wondering if uh, Marvin or Irwin would like to uh, take on the question. Um, there are a, couple, a number of points that have been made. I, I, in no particular order, uh, uh, Weimar Germany, I was going to talk about briefly Weimar Germany. Um, Weimar Germany's laws dealt with insult. Uh, and religious insult. They didn't, in effect, they were sort of blasphemy laws. Um, when, when Stryker was charged, uh, Germany was an anti-Semitic country, and Germany was very close to becoming a Nazi country. Uh, it was too late, uh, and the law was completely ineffective, but those laws did not resemble our present uh, hate laws. But that's beside the point. To the point that, the argument that the laws were brought in to deal with Nazis in the concerns have changed, I agree with you, that's right. Um, uh, the, uh, the concern now is not neo-Nazis. Uh, there was a real concern, not that Canada or the United States was gonna turn into some jack-booted nation of Zeke Heilers, uh, something out of uh, sun sh uh, springtime for Hitler, but, uh, but there was, there really was a movement, there was, uh, there was a rise in, in, uh, in far-right activity in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, that is not, while that has subsided almost to the point where, I wouldn't say it's non-existent, the concerns that this conference deals with are far more, con far more of a concern, and one of the things that I think can be used is, the, uh, is these kinds of laws to deal with the, the terrible and crude anti-Semitism, for example, that comes out of some of these uh, Islamist speakers, and I think that that is important. With regard to the Quran, uh, there have been no cases about the Quran, but there have been cases in Canada dealing with um, biblical injunctions against uh, homosexuality. And uh, a number of findings have been that there's a protection there. So I believe that that would be the case with regard to the Quran, and it should be. Um, anyway, that's, those are my responses.